<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Instituto Internacional. My name is Christopher Quaid. I'm the cultural attaché at the embassy, the U.S. Embassy here in Madrid. And it's a real pleasure to see so many of you here uh, tonight for this wonderful event we're about to have. Um, I'd first like to thank the uh, Inst International Institute and the American Space Madrid for hosting this event and for being such a good collaborator with the embassy uh, on a wide range of activities and events. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Standring for being here tonight and for sharing his wisdom and his insights about the Wyatts with all of us. Uh, as you know, the Wyatts are one of the most important uh, painting families. Uh, this morning, Dr. Standring called them a, a dynasty uh, in, in American art, and I think that's very true. And I think you're really going to enjoy Dr. Standring's presentation tonight. Some of us had the chance to hear him earlier at the Thyssen, and uh, he's very engaging and very knowledgeable about his, uh, about his field. So I think you're going to enjoy the, 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 speak, the talk very much. Uh, one last thing before I turn things over to Alexa. I just wanted to say, at the, at the American Embassy, it's our job and our privilege to be able to try and share the best of American culture with audiences here in Spain. And I think tonight's event is a very, very good uh, representation of that because of Dr. Standring's presence. So again, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed this very much. And now I'll turn things over to Alexa. Good evening. On behalf of the International Institute, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our guests and to our speaker, Dr. Timothy J. Standring. I'm Alexa Brooks, and as an artist and a teacher in the International Institute's American Cultural Studies program, I'm keenly aware of the power of art to transcend and absorb cultural differences to create a global language that we in this room all understand and share. Tonight, the International Institute community is especially thrilled to welcome patrons of the Museo Thyssen Bornemisza. The Thyssen and the Institute share inclusive missions that reflect both institutions' commitment, although through different means, to extending cultural visions to a diverse and broad public. And as both institutions have upheld this mission throughout their respective histories, the museum since opening in 1992, and the International Institute since its founding 100 years earlier in 1892. We are also grateful to the United States Embassy for collaborating with us to make this event possible. We look forward to enduring ties with the Thyssen that go beyond the numerous visits the Institute's American students and professors make each year to learn in the rich, eclectic, and beautifully designed exhibition halls of the museum. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Timothy Standring, is an individual whose work reflects the contemporary globalization of art, both in theory and in practice. Although his home base is the rarefied air of Denver, Colorado, America's Mile High City, where he is the Gates Foundation Curator of Painting and Sculpture at the Denver Art Museum, his approach to art is anything but rarefied. In fact, his exhibitions that include Becoming Van Gogh, Castiglione, Lost Genius, El Greco to Picasso, Sargent and Italy, and many others, consistently win acclaim for the intimacy with which he presents both the artist and the work. In addition to his curatorial work, Dr. Standring is a teacher and scholar who completed his doctorate at the University of Chicago. He taught at Pomona College, Lawrence University, and Loyola University of Chicago, before being appointed director of the School of Art and Art History at the University of Denver. Along the way, he received a number of prestigious grants and fellowships and was a guest scholar at the J. Paul Getty Museum and a senior fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art. The subjects of his published work, Art Patronage in 17th Century Rome, Essays on European Artists, and British watercolor landscapes attest to his academic breadth and scholarly insight into the world of art. We in Madrid are fortunate that the Museo Thyssen Bornemisza supported Dr. Standring's most recent curatorial project, Wyeth, Andrew, and Jamie in the studio. The skill with which this exhibition was designed, 
and the thoughtful promotion of the Wyatt's work by the museum have given Madrileños access to and knowledge about painters whose works are, in many ways, quintessentially American. The exhibition is a testament to the unique and powerful role of the curator in shaping the artistic experience and confirms Hans Ulrich Obrist's claim that a curator is, quote, a catalyst, generator, and motivator, aspiring partner, accompanying the artist while creating a bridge to the public, unquote. Though they are just a fraction of the thousands of visitors to the exhibition, my American Cultural Studies students here at the Institute have been studying the Wyas this trimester. They have been energized by the opportunity to view these paintings in person and to read the contextual material that so brilliantly accompanies them. This evening, Dr. Standring will speak on the studio practice of Andrew and Jamie Wyeth, which will be followed by a question and answer period and an informal Copa de Vino, to which you are all invited. We are grateful to Dr. Standring for taking the time to join us here at the International Institute, and we hope to enjoy not only the relatively easy breathing of Madrid's altitude, but also the sincere interest and enthusiasm we share for his work. Dr. Standring. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. My goodness, thank you for all of that. Um, I'll put this to the side. And now I've got my speaker, my microphone, and I'm going to put this here and uh, get started. So it, it's wonderful to see you all here instead of watching the Euro Cup. But I guess we've got a different audience, too. Uh, my job is to perform stand-up comedy for the next hour. I'll do my best to do that. You can see I'm rather irreverent. Uh, it took five years to put this exhibition together. And what I thought would be helpful and interesting to all of you is to give you behind the scenes, how does this all come together? So you're going to get a, a wonderful braided narrative about uh, curatorial activities. And thank you very much for the pitch about curators. I'm actually a living dinosaur. Uh, the business is actually going into the different direction into more interpretive and experiential. Uh, and the curatorial role, and one of the reasons why I've succeeded in all of the exhibitions that you mentioned, is that I've actually been a wonderful collaborator. So all of you students out there who are looking for how do you get to where I am? <laughs> how do you get to have a life that's a vacation? People say, are you on business or a vacation? I said, my life is a vacation, isn't yours? But the thing about it is that I've always been collaborative and I think that it is my educational background of coming from the academy and being a teacher uh, by the way, I was on the Gypsy Scholar Circuit before I ended up in Genoa, in uh, Denver. So I, I taught in upstate Wisconsin, taught at Loyola University, Southern California. And by the time I got to Denver, I had all these didactic skills to engage my students. For example, when students didn't want to listen anymore, I'd stop talking about art history and I'd give recipes in Italian. Because everybody's interested in food. They didn't want to know about Giotto anymore, so I'd tell them how to make pene al arrabbiata. Okay. And I even, uh, for extra credit, they'd get 10 extra points if they'd give me a new recipe that I didn't know. But you can see, already, you're laughing at my jokes and I'm communicating. So it's the whimsy that, that is helpful, along with the scholarly component. So I tried something absolutely new in my essay. The essay that I wrote for this catalog probably went through 200 drafts. And my wife said, that, that's all? I mean, I turn into Herman Melville when I write, and I you know, leave the food at the door, that kind of thing. But what I did is I went from an art historian to a journalist. And I interviewed many, many different people for this. And I tried to take on a journalist 
New Yorker type of voice. So I'm very much a part of that, and I use my voice in the first person to engage a broader audience to come into the world of Wyatt's. And I, I think it, it worked. And you'll see in the Spanish edition as well as the English edition that that, that was a change. It's all about communicating. Uh, and when we put together exhibitions, it's like putting together a movie. So uh, pr producers and directors don't simply go in and say, shoot from A to B. They actually have story cards made. They have artists who actually do the scenes and, and draw them up and say, this is how I want this scene to take place. You should actually just read all about Hitchcock and how he would programmatically, systematically work every scene up before he filmed it. And that's what we do for our exhibitions. So the various components that you see from gallery to gallery to gallery were nothing more than team efforts of talking with the interpretive team, the curator, the designer, the graphics designer, uh, and everybody else. And so we'd say, how is it going to be self-evident when you walk into this room that this is about father and son? This is about news. This is about animals. This is about X and Y. So these, what you think is a three-ring circus that comes to town and we simply throw the works up on the wall has actually been thought about and sensitively planned uh, for the visitor experience. I've served on panels for the NEH and the NEA. And one of the most important keys that you want when you evaluate grants and fellowship proposals is you want to ask yourself, what is the visitor going to take away? So very much like a TED talk, what's the takeaway from my talk? What's the takeaway from going to an exhibition? I want to make sure that they, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that they see the dialogue happening between Andrew and Jamie. What we didn't want, we didn't want to do an exhibition like the flying Wallendas of painting. <laughs> Remember, the dynasty of the Wyatts is N.C. Wyatt, the great illustrator, Andrew, his son, and Jamie, his son. And they've done the three Wyatts too many times. I wanted the, the chance of serendipity, of discovery, of finding out what I could find by juxtaposing Andrew with Jamie. I didn't even know five years ago that I'd discover as much as I did, that they were actually cut from the same cloth, even though their images are quite different. So th they were very much concerned with seeing fleeting moments as well as peculiarity. And I'll show you how that works in a minute here. So let's go on to here. Um, this is the, there we go, there we go. I, I guess it likes to skip a little bit, um, or let's go back here. There. Uh, this is our titanium clad building, uh, the new addition to the Denver Art Museum. We are a complex of about 70,000 works of art. We're the uh, largest museum within about 700 miles. <laughs> Remember, America is a continent. <laughs> it's, it's a country, but it's also a continent, and it's filled with various regions. And so we built this new building. It's the first building that was uh, designed by Daniel Liebitzkin in America. 9,000 panels of titanium. It's Starship Galactica has landed. Uh, this is the, it, it really is quite fickle. Um, so I'll, how about if I just tell you, do the next one? There we go. This is the interior of Denver, the next at the entranceway. I just wanted to show you a little juxtaposition and the interior of, um, go to the next one. There we go. A little bit of the Denver installation. Let's go to the next one. And the Madrid installation will be the next slide. Yep, and we can go to the next one. There we go. Okay, we, there, there were there 
two different iterations of this project. One was Denver, 120 works, about um, 9,000 square feet. So we have one third of the square footage or square meters in Madrid uh, in half the, the number of works. And what's amazing is that the works function both in Denver as well as in Madrid. And here's one of the views. How many of you seen the exhibition? You can all be honest. Even if, so uh, actually, you all have one more week to see it. And please see it. it it's it's it far out distance their expectations. For 75,000 people, this is huge. For a relatively unknown dynasty of artists who's an icon for most Americans east of the Mississippi. And for people under 50, they don't know who the Wyeths are. You know that Christina's world is at MoMA, at Museum of Modern Art. Um, and I'll tell you a small story about it. It's right next to the escalator and right near the elevators. And it's in the most horrible place you could imagine for the Museum of Modern Art. They will never loan that painting. It should be given a seat on the board of trustees because it raises so much money from the image rights that are paid for the postcards as well as everything else for Christina's World. Now, when the Museum of Modern Art had their 50th anniversary, did they invite the living Andy Wyeth? No. Isn't that amazing? What a story. What a story. And yet it's in practically every textbook across America. It's in virtually every book for American art history. And there's something about that that speaks to us. Why did I get interested in the Wyeths? I'm not part of the American Mafia. I just decided that I wanted to do an exhibition on the Wyeths because I responded so much to both Andy as well as to Jamie. And so there's something that's going on in their art based on their technical craft and their ability to express communication through empathy. There's a lot of empathy. There's a lot of feeling that comes across. People have been in tears in front of Wyeth paintings. And the thing that does that is their kind of Zen moments as to how they actually spend time painting these images. That's father and son, father and son. And the two, so if, if I click on it, yeah, it, it tends to get stuck a little bit. Um, so we'll go to the next one. And, and keep in mind this little outfit here on Andrew. Next. Uh, both artists uh, said that their studios were where they were painting. So even though I said in the studio, we had images of Andy on the beach on Jeeps, uh, which is a Jeep Cherokee. A suburban assault vehicle. Um, and the next one, and Jamie, this is painting, and keep this chest in mind because the chest appears in a portrait of Orca Bates. The next one. So, uh, many of you who don't know the Eastern Seaboard in the United States, um, it's, this is Pennsylvania. Here's New England. Here's New York. Here's Manhattan and Long Island. And the star is right where Pennsylvania curves around with Delaware. So you're only about 10 kilometers uh, to Wilmington. And I call it the Brandywine River Valley because it encompasses both the state of Delaware as well as the state of Pennsylvania. In fact, when I went to Point Lookout Farm, which is Phyllis and Jamie's farm, it's so vast, you drive in in Delaware and you end up in Pennsylvania. How did I know that? Because socialist Pennsylvania requires you to put a sign on your fence that says if you fall off your horse, the owner's not responsible. Whereas capitalist Delaware doesn't need those kind of signs. 
So when I drove through, I said, Jamie, why do you have that sign up? And he said, oh, because we're in Pennsylvania. Now, there's a big train that runs through the entire state. This, of course, is DuPont neighborhood. It's, it's DuPont money. It's all the DuPonts are around there. And the interesting thing about it is when Nureyev came to see this, he told Jamie and Phyllis, and he said, I want farm, I want animals, I want train. So it's a joke. Let's go to the next one. So here is, is Maine, mid-coast Maine, with Allen Island where Betsy lives, Menhegan Island where Jamie has a studio and a house, Southern Island where he's got a studio and a house, Port Tennant right here where he has another studio. He's got another studio at Point Lookout Farm and they also have a residence in Manhattan. I'm telling you too much information. <laughs> and over here is Friendship and Cushing and Tomitston and Rockland. So it gives you an idea. Keep in mind the Wyatts were like migrating birds. Okay, so around Memorial Day, which just took place for all you Europeans, uh, in May, the Wyatts would pack up from the Brandywine River Valley and they would go north to Maine. And then after the national holiday for the Wyatts, which was Halloween, they would pack up and go back down to Pennsylvania. They d were not interested in traveling. Jamie hates to travel. All they want to do is focus on their local individuals that they know, their friends, and they all simply want to paint where their own localities are. And the reason why I point out friendship is that one painting called the Carey was actually painted right at friendship. So there's, and right near Cushing is where Christina Olson's house is. I mean, you can go there. And, and see all of these places. Both studios are on the National Register now for Andrew. In fact, there's going to be a third studio by Andrew that is right at Cushing, and they're not quite ready to turn it over to the National Trust yet, but it's, it's imminent. So let's go to the next one. So um, there were... 30 entities that went up to the Wyeth Center <coughs> and requested <coughs> they requested to do a Wyeth exhibition. I wasn't part of the American Mafia, as I said. I just went up to Jamie. I was on his boat. We were driving out to Menhegan Island. I turned to him and I said, you know, Jamie, you and your father actually were very messy painters. And, and I think you've received poor criticism in your lifetimes. And I think that people have misunderstood what both of you were doing in your paintings. And he pounded his fist on the table and said, yes, that's exactly what my father and I were all about. I won him over as I was looking at the paint and his cuticles, and you could determine what kind of color he was using that day. He was using cobalt blue. So he said yes, and so eventually he talked to the Wyeth people, the center, and, and they eventually opened up their coffers to me, and I'm the first curator to have been able to really put together an exhibition without simply the why of saying, this is what you're going to do. So I was very fortunate, and I won over the trust of them, and I think it shows how the product is, both in the exhibition catalog, the success in Denver, as well as the, the success that's taking place in Madrid. So I, I was determined to say, what's the kind of story that we could tell between father and son? How many other dynasties do all of you know in the history of art? You know many. You don't know it. The Tiepolo, the Bassano, the Calders, the Peels. There are things like this that exist. The Tintoretti, as it were. Uh, his daughter was an artist. So here we have um, Jamie 
uh, who drew his father when he was seven years old. And, and I said, Jamie, you know, you made your father's feet really large. And he said, no, they really were large. <laughs> and here's Jamie. And can you imagine that they were so trustworthy? <clears throat> they left me in the barn to do research where they would say, just lock up Timothy when you're finished. So I went through everything. And I found this little report card, school card, that I took a photograph of and included into my le lectures. Uh, this is Andrew, who uh, painted a watercolor of his son when he was a teenager. And this is N.C. Wyeth, who painted Andy uh, with a friend from Chad's Ford. Now, why, why did N.C. end up in the Brandywine River Valley? because there was an individual called Howard Pyle who was a major illustrator. And Andrew, Andrew's father, N.C., came from Massachusetts and said, I want to learn how to do illustration as well. And Howard Pyle would have a summer workshop. And so after that, N.C. Wyeth, who became a very famous illustrator for Scribner's, said, I'm going to settle here. And that's what they did. So it's, it's a quiet little town that if you blink, you go right through the stoplight and you've missed Chad's Fort. It's that small. It still has the place where Andy would go to eat every day. None of the local people will tell you anything. They're all zipped um, with their stories. But I, let's go, um, there we go, to this, oops. There, we'll keep it to this one. As you open up with the exhibition, I wanted to show something that both artists had, had performed. And so Andrew had painted his son when he was about five. And Jamie was so fidgety that he just kind of threw the watercolor on the floor. And Jamie proceeded to draw, when he was three or four years old, this flying fish and a fisherman. So already he's showing his gift of being Michelangelo of the Brandywine River Valley. Let's go to the next. This is the only work that they consciously worked on together. Uh, and this is a small thing of, of uh, oysters and a shucker. And the shucker was done by Jamie, and the oysters were done by Andrew. Let's go to the next. And I, what I'm going to do in the next couple of slides is simply show you that uh, when I was doing my research, it's, it's kind of interesting in terms of American art history that the Wyeths have actually fallen into the crack of Nowheresville. So most contemporary curators in American museums, even though Wyeth is in the 20th century, they could care less. So they're all in the basements. They weren't even exhibited on the walls. And I'd go down to all of these basements. I went to Winter Tour to look at conservation. I went to a foreign country called Arkansas. Um, you need a visa to go there to protect yourself against chiggers. Um, this is Andrew's studio. And here I'm at the National Cal Academy of Design in New York City. Let's go to the next. And here I am in the basement of Philadelphia, and I'll tell this story in a minute. But the, the point is, is that most curators of 20th century, they didn't even know who Wyeth was. They said, oh, if you want the painting, fine. And then the conservation department sometimes would veto that simply because of egg tempera can be very fickle as a pigment. So as my friend here who's going to America next year, she was asking, she was actually telling me what tempera painting is. And she was telling me that egg tempera painting is when you have the yolk and you take the last skin, the last skin off the yolk, and you puncture it with a sterilized needle, and it goes into distilled water, and you mix it together. That's what your binder is. And then you add powdered pigment to the binder, and then you apply it. If you add more distilled water, you have less binder, and therefore it's going to be less stable, and the water will evaporate, 
and you'll have a flaky surface <clears throat> and the pigment will come off. If you have enough binder, it will stick on forever. What's the binder of watercolor? In fact, what are the ingredients of watercolor? The ingredients of watercolor, and this is important, the ingredients of watercolor are pigment, it could be a, a paste, it could be powder, and then <clears throat> water, and then gum arabic. <clears throat> so if you don't have gum arabic, the water is going to evaporate and it's going to come off the surface of the paper. What's the difference between cold press and hot press paper? And why should we even be interested? Well, <laughs> it's very important because the properties of painting onto these surfaces are going to be incredibly different. If you take a watercolor brush, a red sable watercolor brush, and you apply it to a hot press paper, there's going to be more gelatin on it. It's going to leave an almost indelible mark, and it's going to be very difficult to correct that mark. So you better be sure what mark you're going to make. Whereas if you have cold press paper with a texture to it, you can take your brush and you can make corrections into it when you're painting. And also you can work into it with dry brush painting. And all of these are hugely important. It's very much like teaching a sonnet without understanding the rules. And I think that's what art criticism has done. They've forgotten the rules of painting in the vernacular of realism. And so the critical fortune of the Wyeths has suffered greatly by people misunderstanding the syntax and the vocabulary of the Wyeths language. They didn't read Saucer. It's another intellectual joke. So who is a linguist who talked about the different properties of various language. Now, the reason why I put this woman here is because when I was doing research, after Andrew Wyeth had sold out his entire first show when he was 20 years old, at Macbeth Gallery in Manhattan, he sold every work of art. Now, what's interesting is that his father wrote an unauthor unauthored introduction on behalf of his son. What he did is he was selling his son and he was fashioning his son very much like Jackson Pollock had people fashion him. And like Franz Klein and all the other abstract expressionists, everybody in New York was trying to make it. And the way that they would do it is they would do it through marketing and advertising and Andrew Wyeth wasn't any different. And how do I know that? Because when I went to the archives of American Art in Washington, D.C., I had the letter from N.C. Wyeth that said, this is the introduction for Andy's first show. So then, when he came back, there was a letter in the files that said, we in the Wilmington Watercolor Women's Society would like to have the young Andrew Wyeth come and teach us a lesson. And so he did that. He did this completely from memory, and I called him up and said, do you still have that watercolor that you trained all the women watercolor artists? And they said, yes, you're the first one to call. So there, there's a vast amount of material that hasn't even been touched yet. Let's go to the next. Um, for example, at the National Gallery in Washington, they said, and this is down the street, um, <clears throat> They said, this has never been exhibited. You're the first person to even ask for it, which is an early uh, pen and ink and watercolor. And it's mislabeled. It's called an oak. It's actually a hickory tree instead of an oak. But that table and the chairs will give you some size, some indication of the size of that. Let's go to the next. This is interesting because this is where uh, the schoolhouse, right below the the studio of N.C. Wyeth in the Brandywine River Valley. And this is where Andrew and Betsy had their home uh, for their two children, uh, Nicholas, the older brother of Jamie, and Jamie. And after Andrew's sister, Henriette, married Peter Hurd, they went to New Mexico. Uh, Betsy and Andrew moved in here. 
Betsy didn't like that because she didn't like the in-laws, her in-laws, N.C., who she thought was a little bit too abrasive with Andy. In any case, it's an interesting story. The garbage can here, the oil can, is where Andrew would burn his watercolors that didn't make it. He disliked American dealers from New York hugely, and therefore in front of them would simply stand there burning his watercolors just to get their gall. On the corner of the house, there's a sign that says, please do not knock, I do not give autographs. And the other, the fireplace here, this is the little kind of eating nook, which is a kitchen with uh, a sitting area. And that's where Christina's world was displayed, or I guess it was, no, it was up in Maine where it was displayed. And they would sit around, uh, kind of like a Leave it to Beaver, although it was very racy Leave it to Beaver, family because they're drinking scotch or vodka and smoking cigarettes and they talk about their works of art and what they put Christina's world up nobody said anything and so Andrew said oh god it's a flat tire it's, it's horrible nonetheless he sold the painting for less money than four tires for a BMW so $1,800 is that painting which is an American icon at, the, at MoMA today and the person who paid for the money was Stephen Clark of the Singer Sewing Fortune of the Clark Art Institute uh, that gave uh, the director of MoMA the money to pay for that picture. In any case, this is where Betsy and Andy stayed. This is where Jamie had his studio as well. Let's go to the next. And, I'm, and so here are powdered pigments that Andrew had imported directly from Florence. So I, I looked at the bill of lading, I looked at the invoices, I looked at how much they paid for it, and I also found out that he had this very special gold pigment that he put on a painting, which I'll talk to you about in a second. So this is, these are the pigments. Both Andrew and Jamie would use a mirror when they would paint so that they would, would look at the work in reverse to see it from a distance. Mixing pans, let's go to the next. Uh, he would buy his eggs. He didn't like um, biological eggs. He simply liked the gasoline imported eggs at the Wawa gas station. So he, he just thought that they worked better. Um, and let's go to the next. And this is Jamie's studio right next door. So Andrew is painting with bombastic classical music blasting out of his room. He'd never let anybody watch him paint and yet kids would be walking through, dogs would be walking through, and he would actually be walking on all of his drawings. The point that I wanted to make is that they didn't want to fetishize with their works of art of drawings and make them precious. What they wanted to do is simply sustain that internal idea to get it out in whatever form was coming out. It could have been through a dry brush or possibly with a tempera painting. So this is Jamie's until he was about 20 years old. And by that time, they had moved down to the mill, another studio on the opposite direction of Highway 1 in Chad's Ford. Let's go to the next. And this is Jamie's studio. I was the first one that was allowed in Jamie's studio. His wife, Phyllis, uh, is in a wheelchair. She's been in a wheelchair since she was 20 years old. She had a car accident in which she broke her neck. And so she had a godzillion numbers of operations. And so she uh, said, Timothy, how can I help you? And I said, I'd like to see Jamie's studio. So she called me up and said, come to Point Lookout Farm tomorrow at 9 AM. I got there, and she met me in her little cart and said, go on in there. If you want to see Messy, that's what you'll see. So I took about 50 photographs. <laughs> kind of got myself in trouble, um, but I, I, it was very important for me to see the environment that Jamie had worked on, and it forms one of the bookends of the exhibition catalog. Let's go to the next. This is interesting because Jamie is now working on what he calls tableau vivants. 
they're actually little dollhouse scenes. And what he does is he buys G.I. Joe figures and he snaps off the head. Then he takes a plastine and models the head after historic figures, adds on real hair, has a seamstress who makes all of the cloth outfits for the various figurines. And in some exhibition, uh, there was Andy Warhol at the Russian Tea Room um, with various figures. And so also, he's very much interested in taxidermied animals. And here's all of his various paints. Let's go to the next. Here's Jamie with his bowler hat. And he, he just wears two different socks every day. Uh, he buys about $300 worth of socks every six months. And this is, he's on uh, Benner Island, Brenner Island, across from Allen Island, where Betsy lives. And uh, Betsy has actually created an active lobstering compound for many of the people from Port Clyde who do their fishing off of Brenner Island. And also, it's an ecological system for the University of Maine. Let's go to the next. Here's Guillermo over here. And, and Jamie, we're plotting the exhibition. Next. Um, here's the interior of the barn. Uh, by the way, the, the, just to give you a scale, those planes are eight feet long. So that shows you how large. And this banner was exhibited at the Jamie Wyeth exhibition in Boston, as well as we used it in our installation in Denver. Let's go to the next. A uh, place is very important for both artists. And I just wanted to show you this is Ida Proper's house. You can still see on Manhegan Island. And here it is in a watercolor. If you go to Mid-East Maine, go to Port Clyde and take the mail boat uh, for the 10 kilometers over to Manhegan Island and walk around Manhegan Island, two thirds of which is a national preserve, which was paid for by the son of Thomas Edison. Let's go to the next. And here are the twin houses built by Rockwell Kent in a watercolor which is owned by Mariner Kemper in Denver. Let's go to the next. Here's my research that I undertook at the National Archives in uh, Washington, DC. And, and these are letters and correspondence of the works that were sold in his first exhibition and how much they garnered from the sale. And the next one. Here are actually the diaries of Thomas Hoven. I was the first one to touch the Thomas Hoven papers at Firewood, Firestone rare book room at Princeton University. I went there and said, I'd like to look at the Hoving papers. Why, why Thomas Hoving, the former director of the Metropolitan Museum? It's because he actually did a major exhibition on the Wyeths at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The curator of contemporary art at the last minute turned to Thomas Hoving and said, I'm sorry, Thomas, I just can't do this exhibition. So you're going to be stuck with it, which he did. And so he had vast notes of diaries. And I'm the first one that found recordings of Thomas Hoving with Andrew Wyeth, which were then cleaned up by Hoving and put into the exhibition catalog for that Met show. This is Richard Merriman, who sadly just passed away this past year. And he wrote a, a beautiful biography, a little bit hagiography laden. Uh, on Andrew Wyeth, uh, but the two of them had also recorded interesting conversation. Keep in mind that I, there's lots of dirt that I found, lots of dirt. But it wasn't appropriate to put it in the exhibition catalog. It didn't add to purpose. If I was going to write another biography on Andrew, I would. If I was going to write a biography on Jamie, I would. But it, I didn't need to put those kind of things in such an essay. Let's go to the next. This is my table where I worked on the 200 drafts of this exhibition catalog. And my wife said it's not long enough. Let's go to the next. And also during research, I went to a Wyeth Halloween party dressed as a satyr. And I left Rockland, Maine, and they sent me to the wrong island. And I ended up in this blue collar fishing village. And, and because I had a onesie on, my fingers couldn't touch my iPad to get the right <laughs> GPS 
for the map, and so I'd open up the window, and these blue-collar people kind of looked at me, yeah, bud, what do you want? <clears throat> Meanwhile, I, I arrived at the party, and the rule of a Wyeth Halloween party is that you can't expose who you are. <coughs> so I walked around for a half an hour, hoofs and all, and they were just completely freaking out. They had no idea. They, they, um, and finally, a person dressed as Papagena with her beak started poking me in the back. And said, who are you? Who are you? And I finally blurted out and explained who I was. So, but that was all part of research, right? You know, let's go to the next. So, team down. Let's go to the next. So, some of you <coughs> are interested in how we put together exhibitions at the Denver Art Museum. And as I explained, it's, it's a whole team process. There's nothing more contentious than <clears throat> in American museums to say, who's in charge? I think the best way to produce the best exhibitions is to let everybody do what they do best. And if we're not going to have fun, then don't do it. So I, you can imagine what an anarchist I was. I couldn't stand these meetings. <laughs> there were so many of them that I had to go to, but nonetheless, I was trying to be good at every one. In any case, this is our, our designer, Ben, our interpreter, Stefania, uh, Jill, our exhibition manager, our graphic designer, and our uh, assistant. And this is a think tank room where we have four walls where you can put up all the pegs of the possibilities for your exhibition narrative. I had about 230 up, and I was telling everybody this morning that our financial officer and said, came in and said, you know, we have got a budget. You've got to cut. And I said, that's not my problem. My problem is to tell the best story. Your problem is to raise the money to make this exhibition. I just didn't want to cut yet. Because you, you're working out, if you don't get one key loan to tell that story, then you've got to relate to your B list. Let's go to the next. So we, we then have a large uh, plan here. Uh, coming in here, intro experience, and you zigzag inside and out. This area we'll get to in another slide is going to be a little shack, which we moved over against the wall here. So let's go to the next. <clears throat> We've got a metal in which we have little figures here. And we take all the images and scale them to size in relationship to the footage of the wall in the model so that we can say, is this going to work? We tried these new interpretives. And you know what? Isn't it interesting? And I'm going to expect a huge round of applause. For the American Association of um, American Museums, they have a convention every year, and they have six awards for excellence. One award is for interpretives and for inst installation of exhibitions. What won this year? Why? In Denver. How about that? So let's go to the next. And uh, after we have that, we have the size of all the images where we put our preliminary lights up. Why is this important? Because all the couriers are going to come in. They're going to watch the works coming from, let's say, Pennsylvania or from Maine. They're going to watch them come out of the box. They're going to check their, their sheet of um, the condition. And they'll say, yes, this is fine. And then they're going to stand there until it's hung. And you can't move it. So you better be sure as to where you're going to put that work of art. So we want to make sure that we take care of all of the equipment needs earlier before we then begin to nail the works onto the wall. So we have the lighting technician. Let's go to the next one. Then we have these templates in paper, uh, which shows the size of the image with the frame. We'll go to the next one. And because we had 
uh, stuffed animals, we had hazmat suits that we had to put on because we didn't want the Hunta virus to affect any of our staff members. We borrowed these from the Natural History Museum. Jamie loved them. Let's go to the next. And uh, now I'm going to talk about the exhibition narratives in the scene. Now, keep in mind that I wanted to juggle up and change the whole dialogue about the Wyatts. So did, did you all know that during the early 50s that there were very important essays written by abstract expressionist critics? So Elaine de Kooning, the wife of Wilhelm de Kooning, one of the great abstract expressionist painters. The wife of Saarinen, Ario Saarinen, wrote another perceptive article. This is in 1950 and 1952. And they talked about Andrew Wyeth as if he were almost an abstract expressionist. Go to the next one. So if I showed you a surface like this, you'd, you'd think something about painterly texture, about uh, a fluid, liquid handling of the surface. In fact, Andrew said, all I want to do is paint backgrounds. Let's go to the next. And that was a, a close-up of this portrait of this old sea dog, Walt Anderson, which I got from Raleigh to come to the scene. I wanted to bring the, the dialogue back to process and to an understanding of their materials and techniques as the basis then to which you could bring interpretive discussions and narratives to the paintings. If you talk to anybody about Wyatt, they're going to talk about sentimentality. And they're going to talk about subject matter. Rarely are they going to talk about craft and technician and the ability to bring that to then communicate content. Let's go to the next. Isn't that just incredible? <clears throat> The way I got this, and I'm going to display one of my negotiating t tricks. They had another painting which was called Winter with a young man running down a hill of 1946-47. So I kept punting on that one saying, oh, come on, can't you loan that? Can't you really? And I really wanted this. Can't you really loan this painting? And they said, no, I'm sorry, Timothy, you know, and I said, oh. You know, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. And you think you could loan this one? And he said, oh, yeah. So, <laughs> and that's the one that I wanted, uh, but I didn't tell him. I think he's going to kill me when he hears the story. But anyway, let's go to the next. <clears throat> Andrew, unlike Jamie, has four different kinds of signatures, from a Volkswagen or a Mini all the way up to a Mercedes-Benz and a Bentley. This is the Bentley and the Mercedes, you know, the lice, Andrew Wyeth. So some are just AW and ballpoint pens when ballpoint pens weren't even used, so they were signed much later with Betsy telling Andrew to sign it. Betsy, by the way, titled all of Andrew's paintings. So Christina's World, it was Betsy. So The Virgin, it was Betsy. All of these titles came from Betsy. Let's go to the next. And here's Jamie. I was very much interested in surfaces. Let's go to the next one. Just shows a detail here. And we can go to the next one. This is a, a drawing which I decided in the end not to use it, but it's illustrated in the catalog. And you can see that there are heel marks throughout the entire drawing. There are dog paws, the kids walking across, everything. In other words, they were strewn all around, and, and that Andrew and Jamie both internalized these things. They didn't want to fetishize these drawings. Let's go to the next. And the reason why I didn't use that is because I was going to get the Cincinnati painting, but they couldn't travel because of the fragility of the tempera surface, of which, remember I talked to you about that foreign country called Arkansas? I was at a private collection in Arkansas. And after having lunch with them, I was in this big oak paneled boardroom um, and then I, we finished lunch, and then I went up close to a large painting about the size of that wall, which is all in tempera. And it had that gold speckled pigment to it. And right under an air conditioning duct was ribbons, ribbons of tempera. And so I had triage uh, to get a conservator with um, the owner, as well as their dealer, to come and do conservation on that painting. 
because I said, I don't think Andrew had wanted this to be an interactive painting <laughs> of paint peeling off. Let's go to, oh, we can keep, that's fine. This, <clears throat> I'm gonna shift stories here. So it's about a dialogue of father and son reacting to each other, and they actually were quietly competitive with each other. And Andrew actually responded to Jamie, some of his challenges. And Jamie certainly lived under the shadow of his father. And he decided that he would become a portrait painter. And even though his father received this portrait commission from a very famous pediatrician from Johns Hopkins, he said, Jamie, you can do this. So 17-year-old Jamie drove down to Cape Cod, north to Cape Cod, and he stayed there for about six weeks and painted Helen Tossick, who was a very famous pediatrician physician from Johns Hopkins. And when they exhibited it at the unveiling, there were people aghast. They were in tears. They were saying, what monster child had painted such an ugly painting? And what they wanted, they wanted Betty Crocker instead of Helen Tussig the way she looked. And yet, so they tucked it away, they gave it, it ended up with the family and eventually it went back to Johns Hopkins and it became a star of the show, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts exhibition on Jamie. And then Johns Hopkins sent an official apology to Jamie saying, we are so sorry that we traumatized you psychologically when you were 17 years old by telling you that it was such a horrible painting. Let's go to the next. Jamie started off painting in a Hans Memling style. Let's go to the next one. Uh, he painted this portrait posthumously of President Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, which is on a stamp for the nation of Ireland. And the Kennedys never commissioned this. They didn't like it. The process that Jamie used is that he followed around Bobby and Tenny, Teddy Kennedy. He watched film footage. And what he discovered about the Kennedys is that they tap their teeth when they're nervous and that they had a lazy left eye. And that's what he captured and that's what led to Bobby Kennedy Sr. to say, I, I don't think we want this portrait, even though Jackie really loved it. And it's now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts because Jamie gifted it to them. Let's go to the next. Orca Bates, we saw the little cargo uh, box here. He was a wild boy or so-called wild boy. He really wasn't wild, but Jamie wanted to affect that story and so he was so enamored of Orca modeling for him that he let Orca sign his own name, go to the next one, by himself. And so Orca just took this very bright red and said, here I am, Jamie. Uh, basically, you know, okay, next. This is an interesting painting that just sold for $1.4 million at an American auction. So when you're inducted into the National Academy of Design, you're asked to do a self-portrait. Jamie didn't quite fulfill the head, so he put a pumpkin on top of it. The National Academy said, we don't want this. So the guy who owned uh, QTV or whatever, Joe Siegel, owned this picture. And I have a, an email correspondence that goes on forever. Uh, I was trying to use my best to get that picture for the exhibition, and I said, we will actually make a gicle for you, uh, which is this, this very nice uh, imitation of the painting. And he said, <clears throat> well, if you think it looks just like the painting, why don't you put your gicle in the exhibition, and I'll keep the painting. So uh, I said, no, I don't think it's going to work. Anyway, let's go to the next. Um, this is where we have uh, Jamie painting Andy Warhol. Let's go to the next one and the next one. It's from Cheekwood in Nashville. And they had an exhibition in 1976 in July in the middle of Manhattan with lines around the block. Warhol had spent four minutes taking Polaroids of Jamie. Jamie took 250 hours to paint 
his portrait of Warhol. Let's go to the next. And what he actually did, and this is an interesting irony about American art. Both of the Wyeths are the most European academic trained. Their techniques go all the way back to the academy. So it's basically the French Academy from Italy uh, transferred over to American soil. And so all of the techniques of learning how to do chiaroscuro, how to mix paints, how to then add color, how to design, all of this come, goes all the way back to Vasari. And also you would do measurements, uh, and Jamie's doing all of these techniques. And it's like a foreign language. If you don't use it, you get rusty. It's like writing fiction. You know, if you make a mistake in a book, you hate it, you throw the book against the wall, I'm going to stop reading this because the writing is so flabby. The same thing on a painting. If you make a mistake on the painting, you see that, and you respond to that, not the entire work. but So he actually measured Warhol quite much. Let's go to the next. Um, whereas his father, Andy, would use drawings as he did for his wife called Magda's daughter. And this is the first time that this painting has been seen with the drawing in which he used sewing thread on actual tacks, nailed into a board where the drawing was glued onto the board. <coughs> and he wanted to show the transfer for the painting. Let's go to the next. Jamie would use templates after he would execute his figure. He'd do a transparent tracing to use for subsequent portraits of Nureyev. Nureyev said, you're measuring some, me so much you could make me a suit. Let's go to the next one. I wanted, we wanted to show the immersiveness of the Wyeths to take a person like Carl Kerner here in a in a painting called The German, first time this drawing had ever been shown with a tempera that came from uh, New Mexico and the actual room at the Kerner House to show this for our audiences how much. Andrew, by the way, was allowed to simply walk through people's homes. So imagine sleeping with your significant other and there's Andrew sketching the two of you which he had done to a sleeping color couple. Uh, he also walked all the way around with the Kerner house, and that's, in fact, how he met Helga Testorf, one of his models. Let's go to the next. Here's Orca. I just wanted to show you this in relationship to a bedroom, the next one that exists on Monhegan Island, that, that that mustard yellow was used as the background for the portrait of Orca with all the sparring gear for whaling. Let's go to the next. Um, this is Dolly in 1967, where Jamie, I think, finally makes his, his mark and says, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of finished painting portraits. I just want to paint animals. They're easier. Let's go to the next one. You can see how thick the paint is reacting and responding against his father. Let's go to the next. At one point in the exhibition, we wanted to show the exuberant side of painting with the next one and the next with exquisite craftsmanship on the part of both artists. They had two different directions, moving in precision as well as exuberant painting. And uh, can you go back to the other one? <clears throat> If uh, all of you in class, I put this up in your art history class and told you to identify this, if your grade would be dependent upon it, nobody, I'm sure, would say Andrew Wyeth. You'd probably say some abstract expressionist painter, but there are many, many more of these brilliantly exuberant watercolors uh, that are unframed on large sheets of paper that uh, Andrew had done. Let's go to the next two. Next one. In our exhibition, we had Christina's World, which came from Japan, uh, which was an idea that Andrew would come up with the first idea that he wanted to jot down. And what he decided to do is he was looking out the window from the Olsen house, and he had seen Christina Olsen, who suffered from uh, wasting disease. So she had a, a sort of polio palsy 
And so she didn't use a wheelchair. She simply dragged her body around the hillside. And he squared it for transfer, and this became the basis for the famous painting, Christina's World. Let's go to the next. Um, another drawing that was squared for transfer, and the next, Christina, next. This is interesting because we have uh, preliminary drawings that related to trodden weed. Let's go to the next. And this is an interesting drawing. How many of you know what a stump is when you draw with, with graphite? So it's a little piece of felt that you put the graphite on the paper, then you rub the felt into the paper, and it modulates the surface. And I thought that he was using a stump, and he wasn't. After I examined this with lenses, he used about 6,000 little dots of the pencil. So it's all stipple, uh, which is quite amazing, just for this little 5 by 7 drawing of the boot. Uh, Andrew had just had lung surgery. One of his lungs was removed, and so he was told to go out and walk around. And so in his recovery, he put on these boots that were purchased from Howard Pyle, and uh, then that became the basis for this painting called Trodden Weed. We just have a couple more slides left. Let's go. Next one. Uh, Jamie. Next. Jamie. Next. Nudes. The story about nudes is really interesting in the Wyeth family because Andrew had done some nudes in the 30s, but then abandoned completely painting the human figure. But then, next one, his son had drawn his cousin with these blazing bikini lines, his cousin Robin McCoy, and that led to a big kerfuffle among the Wyeth family, saying, Jamie, you can't paint your cousin in the nude. And Andrew said, he can paint whatever he wants. And so he was inspired by this, go to the next one, to paint this young girl underage, Siri Erickson. So he's driving his car down Cushing. Christina Olsen had just died. Andrew's looking for another muse. He stops and says, Siri, go in and ask your parents if I can paint you in the nude. She comes back out and says, yeah. So go to the next one. So he wanted to show her coming out of the door of this barn in Maine next and that it ended up becoming this magnificent painting, which is at, at the Brandywine River Valley Museum, which his wife, Betsy, had called the Virgin. So Betsy said, Andrew, if you ever do this again, don't ever tell anybody about this, because all the town people are talking in Cushing. So the next. So he then decided to begin painting Helga Testorf quietly, in secret, for 15 years. And this is not when he started painting her. This is many years later. Let's go to the next. And so there were three works, or three or four works, in the exhibition. This is in watercolor. Let's go to the next one. These two, which were shown side by side, and sometimes Andrew would deflect his wife by using four different models for these two figures, one for the midsize, one for the shoulders, one for the head, and one for the feet. And then he interpreted the figure here in watercolor and into a dry brush painting, which eventually ended up to another version in tempera, which is called the Barracoon, uh, which is um, this negress who had come over from Africa. So Barracoon were the various slaves who were put into these very tight little beds uh, on the shipping uh, transportation. Let's go to the next. Uh, when uh, Andrew had finished this, he was so excited about it that if you see the drawing, it's, it has a big slash right across it. <clears throat> when he was pulling it off the block, he almost tore the entire drawing in half. Let's go to the next. When I gave a lecture in Denver, I told a, a largely woman's audience, and I said that Helga was going to be at the opening, and that Robin McCoy was going to be at the opening. And, and when I showed this, one woman said, is he going to be at the opening? So let's go to the next. 
wondrous strange. And we can just go through these very quickly. Um, let's, sorry, go back to this one because there's an interesting story about this. You saw the jacket earlier on. That's the $180,000 jacket which we used as a prop. Well, in the background is Hellbop Comet as well as pearlescence stars. And the way that Jamie was able to get the pearlescence is he simply took a pearl necklace from his wife's jewelry box and ground down the pearls uh, to make the pigment. And this is uh, Tenant's Harbor on Southern Island, uh, the East Wind Inn. And right over here is where Jamie's residence is with Phyllis. Let's go to the next, next one. Um, there's a great video which you can watch on TV of this one in Fairno. Next, next. This is just to show you the kind of macabre side of the Wyas, which you could go on forever talking about this, their love of Halloween, of strange jokes. Let's go to the next. And you were talking about the seven deadly sins, which may have been influenced by a whole series by Paul Cadmus that Jamie had seen when he was in Lincoln Kirstein's apartment. But the, probably the most bizarre one is, is this one called Sloth, that this pigeon is so sloven, uninterested in not even eating the lower half of a torso of a human being. Let's go to the next. I'm sorry, the slide's not the best. Let's go to the last one here. Here we go. And my final story is going to be about this one. Jamie's working on a series. Unlike his father, who's interested in fleeting moments and capturing a stump of a tree, a corner of a room, uh, a shadow on a windowsill, Jamie's interested in peculiar. He's working on paintings called Untorrated Occurrences on Manhegan Island. And this is a time when they were closing everything up in late September, early October on Menhegan Island. And this is the Menhegan Island Hotel, owned by a woman. And there was a religious group there that had too much alcohol. He's completely smashed and drunk. He has a little plastic bib around himself. And he's screaming like a Caravaggio painting. And the reason why he's screaming is because the woman of the hotel is walking around without any clothes on. Let's go to the next. The end. I, <clears throat> in Spanish or in English. Um, yeah. Hello. Quería saber, por favor, cuál es la técnica del pincel seco. Um, a, a very good question. Uh, dry, dry brush technique is where you take the brushes and you tampen out the liquid on the brush and you apply it to the surface almost as if it's very dry. So you um, in fact, it, it's important to understand a little bit about brushes. So I've got five <clears throat> hairs of sable, okay? One hair of sable has little spokes coming out of it, like a, 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 a dead pine tree. Now, these little spikes are actually the spikes that hold the little floating fragments of pigment. And when they all come together, those little pieces of pigment are, are held there with encased in water. And when you squeeze out the water, you just have pigment instead of a, a more liquid um, approach. And so it's, it's, you're changing the viscosity of the paint itself when you apply it to the paper. Th does that help? Yeah, OK. Don't all ask at once. <laughs> um, 
don't, don't be shy. Just, just make any response, any, any kind of question, because I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here to share about the bias. Yes. Hello. Um, you have mentioned that realism is sometimes uh, disparaged. Uh, where do we situate realism in the current art market? Uh, a very good question, which I will repeat to everybody. Um, I talked about realism as being disparaged. How do I feel about realism today in, in current art market? Um, I think it's a whole world of discovery. I think that there are, are fabulous artists that need to be understood on their own terms. You just had the, the compliment of the exhibition of Antonio Lopez Garcia and the Ma Madrid School, and um, it's, it's the poetic content that they put into those paintings. It, I mean, it's, it's like abstract expressionists. There's good abstract and there's bad. Um, there are good realist artists, and then there's many. Uh, and I think you just have to determine it based on, on the, the poetic message that they're able to, to bring to the work of art itself. Yes. <clears throat> Hi. Thank you. It was really good. Um, I wanted to know what was the the thing that you enjoy the most, and what you enjoy the least of putting up this exhibition? What, what, uh, what, what you enjoy the most? The most, oh, I'll and tell the you. the least. Oh, the most and the least. Well, the least you know, the meetings. Oh my God. Um, but I'll tell you how I was an anarchist at one meeting. And then I'll tell you about the best. Uh, on Manhegan Island, <clears throat> I, I encourage you all to take the boat. Did, did anybody see Bubba Gump, the movie? Okay, well, anyway, it's, it's a silly ass, excuse my French, it's a silly ass movie, and it's where Bubba Gump goes, runs across the country, and runs to the easternmost point, and he ends up at Port Clyde. That's where you take the boat to go to Manhegan Island. I mentioned Manhegan Island is two-thirds natural nature preserve. And they have little cottages there. And on many of the cottages, there are So the backpackers would walk around, and you'd see these little fairy villages and people's homes. So I said, we should put in little fairy doors in the exhibition. So we built seven little fairy doors where kids got on their knees and climbed over to open the fairy door. To look at the photographs. Isn't that neat? I mean, we, had, we, we got a whole AP piece of press out of that. We had families talking about it. We had dinner parties where people said, can you believe that we put those things in for children? Well, what are you going to do for kids who are hip-hop? They're bored with their parents coming through, but they love the ability to then see Siri and then see Siri in the photograph and look at the painting. It worked. Now, what's the best thing I love? Uh, just sitting there um, looking at the works of art. I'm lucky standing there. Uh, I, mean, to, to simply, yeah. I have a question okay, that's sorry. related to that. Um, the, you talked about the fairy doors that were at the Denver exhibition, but those weren't here in the Madrid exhibition. And uh, my class was wondering, how did the, the exhibitions change from Denver to Madrid? Were there any losses, gains? <coughs> Good question. Uh, let me let me just change my equipment here. Um, the, the question is, what, what were the changes? Well, the changes were um, a different sensibility. Uh, they're both fruit, but one was a banana, one was uh, oranges. Uh, they were different. I had 120 works in Denver. I had uh, about half as many here. I had different spaces. Um, 
different conditions completely. Now, I mean, we, we did a lot of radical things, I believe, for Madrid. They, they were completely frightened when I sent in my colors for wall colors. They said, God, what, what, I mean, he's just gone completely bonkers. You know, with marigold yellow and cerulean blue and terracotta red and, and those um, elephant grays, but don't they work? I mean, all of those uh, paintings come off the walls in a really interesting, different way. We also had um, just a limited amount of, in terms of budget, in terms of graphics, in terms of other things. We had a bigger team working in Denver, and um, it was one of our, our beacon exhibitions, and so uh, they, they invested a lot of money in the installation. So it was partially dictated by finances, partially by uh, my time, because um, I didn't really know I was going to be the curator <laughs> here. <laughs> but when they called me in November and said, by the way, Timothy, you, you're involved in the installation, colors, didactics, everything. So um, uh, to tell you a little bit about writing the didactics, in Denver we have a rule that uh, extended labels are 75 words for uh, section labels, it's only 125 to 150. And I would actually watch my computer watching the words go by up and down, up and down, whether I'm making it. And I, I, um, then I would then give it to the interpretive team. Uh, they would massage it a little, come back. We'd agree on it. It'd go to the editor. We might fight about some Latinity or not. They would take the Latinity out. I would like to keep it in. Um, and and there you have it. So it's um, but but believe me, it's 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 teamwork. And this crew at the at the Tyson did a fabulous job. I mean, I I love the entrance way, the way it kind of brings this. And and I think I the initial image of um, of the young da uh, Jamie is looking like Davy Crockett. Uh, came out a little dark, and they changed it completely. Uh, they, they said, it came out too dark, we're going to redo this. Great. Great attention to detail. Question? Other questions? Okay. Thank you. Did you ever consider including any works by N.C. Wyeth in the exhibition? Uh, absolutely not. The, the question is, did I ever consider putting any works by N.C. Wyeth in the exhibition? No. He's, he's there in spirit. Uh, he, he taught his father indirectly, and uh, Jamie learned indirectly from his aunt, Caroline, uh, what was going on with N.C. Isn't this fun? I mean, this is better than the World Cup, isn't it? <laughs> or uh, the Euro Cup. Well, and Jamie, in particular, seems to embody that spirit of NC even more with his narrative qualities in his paintings. But yet he, was, he wasn't even born when NC died, so they never actually met. No, he, he's, he's there in spirit. Because uh, Jamie actually has, if you read the essay, he's got more of a narrative component to his art. He's interested in telling stories. And his father really doesn't have that. He's got a different kind of poetry that's working in his paintings. And Jamie loves that storytelling. He's working on a whole series of, of the Kennedys, of uh, the family living under Joe Kennedy. He's working on a piece which is called um, Chateau du Pont. Um, so he, he's not finished by, and he's doing people walking out of antique uh, screen doors. So he has Warhol walking out of one. His next one was Atticus Finch, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird walking out of another door. So uh, one of my students noticed that the flag, the symbolism behind that piece with Warhol and the screen door, and it has like an American flag in it. Are, are these going to be iconic figures in America? Is that where the series is going? <coughs> um, uh, who knows? I mean, Jamie won't talk. He, oh, okay. <laughs> he'll, he'll just say, here, have another glass of wine uh -huh. and have fun. Uh -huh. he, he's the most evasive person. Oh, really? 
He's a gentleman's gentleman, he, but he won't talk about his content. Very no. Interesting. Uh, and, and by the way, for the American students who, or the, the students who talked about the American flag, there are many screen doors in America, antique screen doors, where it's had stencil, stencils of flags on it. it I know it's weird, but, <laughs> but, but that's it in New England. Um, it's a continent of many different people across the big pond over there. Um, I have a million questions. Yeah, Alejandro? Oh, Hi. Um, uh, the story behind the Helga paintings fascinates our class. And uh, we know that many of them were purchased by a soul collector. Uh, are those paintings ever sold? Do you know? Uh, many were, were owned by one collector. Uh, that one collector has many more. Yes, they are shown. I mean, they're, they're loaned out. Uh, for exhibitions. Uh, can you tell, uh, tell us more about when these paintings were involved uh, to the public? Uh, uh, what was it that made Andrew decide to, to end the secret behind these paintings? Can uh, when the paintings were unveiled, what was it that made Andrew decide to show them publicly? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, the, so the references to the 15 years of paintings of Helga, and uh, I think he just lost his guts. <laughs> to keep hiding them. Well, he, yes, he, he had a crisis, I think, of mortality and said, I, I, I can't die. <laughs> I can't die in the world and not know that I did this. And so he finally fessed up American slang for saying he finally agreed. And he went to Jamie and said, Jamie, you have to help me. And Jamie said, screw off, Dad. This is your problem. You've got to deal with it. Because uh, Betsy, his wife, is, who's still around, is an, an incredibly formidable person. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't want to face her. But uh, she took it in stride, and now there are others who have written completely and said that this was all a ruse, that it was simply a marketing device on the part of the Wyeths. Mm. So if, if you dig deep, deep enough in Google, you'll find these articles in legal reviews as well as in media reviews, which have actually analyzed the sequence and the history of that that you could actually write an interesting MA thesis about the roofs of the Helga paintings. Now, I, I met Helga on a number of times, and Helga <clears throat> uh, attacked me like a, a T-Rex uh, and grabbed my arm and said, you can't do this art, you can't do this exhibition. I'm the only one who saw Andrew paint. And I said, well, Helga, that's what historians do. We make up stories. I'm not here to uh, interview you. I, I simply want to see where uh, Andrew lived as a little boy and where Jamie lived as a little boy. And this is at Eight Bells, which is outside of um, Port Clyde. And that home is now owned by Helga. Fascinating. Hmm. Maria. Being the first time that uh, the Wyatt exhibition is coming to Europe, is this exhibition going anywhere else after Madrid? It's a good question. It's the first time that an exhibition on father and son had ever been produced to the Wyatts. It's not the first time the Wyatts had been shown in Europe. It's the first time in Spain. Um, we were originally going to send the exhibition to uh, Denmark, to Copenhagen, but they couldn't get their act together and I just had to cut the, the cord and say, we've got to move on. But it was in, originally intended to be a three venue exhibition, uh, which is why I don't have very much hair. Um, <laughs> because it's, it takes a lot of logistical work to send it to another venue. Uh, uh, there have been requests, but um, I'll let somebody else do that. I have a question. Um, well, 
Uh, Christina's world is a fantastic painting. Um, I'm under 50, and we did learn it. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I actually grew up not very far from Child's Ford in Maryland. Okay. Um, would you have included Christina's world if you had been able to? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but I didn't even bother asking. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, the, the word N-O is not in my vocabulary when I ask for paintings, for works of art. One, for my Van Gogh exhibition, I asked one institution in the Midwest eight times before they finally agreed to loan a painting. Mm -hmm. That's rather tenacious. Mm -hmm. Yes, question over here. Mm. Okay. Um, I have noticed that people often mix the terms figurative and realistic art. Could you tell us the difference between these two types of art? Um, I, well, first of all, figurative always implies that you've got human figures in it. Realist could be still life, it could be landscape, um, it could be um, a replication of, of the visual world. So in, they're interchangeable in a way, but figurative would apply more to uh, human beings <clears throat> in their paintings. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to share ownership of the answer. <laughs> well, uh, and the figure, if it's figurative, it's, it could be still an uh, abstraction, abstraction or expression, mm. expressionistic. Um, wouldn't you agree? <laughs> but not necessarily I mean, well, realistic. Well, look, at, you, you could have de Kooning and say it's figurative. So de Kooning's you know, women's series that certainly don't look like women I know, but, <laughs> but he, it's entitled that. It's, it's, there's a, a linguistic component to entitling the painting. And it's, but it's anything but figurative. But, but critics use the term and say, well, he's in his figurative moment. But, well, yeah. But. Was there another question on this side? No? no? Well, I guess there's free wine. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, anyway, c a could couple I? Couple notes before we go. What? A couple notes before we go. Oh, sure, sure, sure. But but I, I wanted to say you are all the best audience. You oh. laughed at all my jokes. Um, I would like to say that this exhibit is still going. Uh, it's, it ends on the 19th, I believe. Yeah. And. Does. Now that we have all this fantastic information, the inside scoop, I really hope that everyone will take that, that time to go down and see the, the TSEN exhibit. Um, please, you are invited to the uh, glass of wine with us, and also there's more information about the TSEN and the Institute in the lobby, and thank you very much. Thank you.